Long ago, at the end of the last great ice age, there arose in the north a powerful queen. Her name was Juliana, and her ambition was to extend her realm to all the regions of the known world. To this end, she gathered an army, and she bore a son and named him Necron, and him she tilted in the black arts and in the powers of the mind. And when Necron came of age and attained mastery of those powers, together they seized control of the region of ice. And from their castle called Ice Peak, they sent a giant glacier rumbling southward. No village or people could stand against its relentless onslaught. And so the remnants of humanity fled south and huddled for warmth among the volcanoes of a mountain region ruled by a generous king named Jero, from his fortress which men called Fire Keep. And still Necron pushed the ice ever southward into the temperate zone toward Fire Keep, and no one dared guess at the outcome of a meeting on the field of battle between fire and ice. This is the emergency podcast system. This is not a test. Movies are bombing all over the country. They are posing as movies you already know. They may already be in your theaters, your neighbor's home, or even your own. Do not panic. Specialists have been dispatched. They will help you identify these pretenders and defend you against this invasion of the remake. Please stand by for further instructions. Welcome to the Invasion of the Remake podcast, where today we're going to be talking about Ralph Bakshi, the man who made famous a cat snorting cocaine off a cartoon rabbit's tits. <laughs> Summed well. Yeah, that's. I think that's a good uh, good lead in. Sam yeah. Stepanenko. Hello. How the uh, hell are you? Not sure that's where I would have gone, but uh, you know what? It's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, and we've got Tony from Flix X Ray today. How's it going? Good. How are you today? Fantastic. Thanks uh, for joining your us. Your place is confusing to find, we're not going to lie. It is. It, it's uh, It's to keep all the, the fans away. Oh, smart. But all one of them? All, all <laughs> one of them. And and all our guests as well. <laughs> ah, it's a tactical thing. I got it's it. It's a tactical thing. It's, it's a chess commitment. If you can find it, you deserve to be on the show. That's right. <laughs> don't, don't let that be an open invite, everybody. <laughs> You say that that accidentally happened to me on my show recording this week. Uh, I had a guy who's guest on other episodes randomly show up for the wrong night when we were recording a different episode because I pre scheduled oh, no. a lot of them. And I was like, ah, get in here. We'll just do this anyway. I, I have an extra <laughs> mic for a reason. Well, you know what? They, you roll with the punches, right? You just do it. No, that happened with the Discord that we did and just everybody kept showing up. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, other people were showing up for the for uh, not the wrong show, just not the show they were scheduled for. No, and it was it was fine. <laughs> yeah, you just roll with it. You just go with it. Exactly. Yeah. And it's fun when they're not prepared for the episode that you're recording too. Right? You can- oh yeah, this was uh, definitely one of those. So the guy was supposed to be showing up for an animated feature similar to what we're doing tonight, mm-hmm. uh, except for instead of that, he showed up for uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. <laughs> oh. we made the mistake of trying to remake that <laughs> oh good luck that was pretty much the consensus was uh, oh please i had a lot of fun on that one. you did have a lot of fun on that one because <laughs> it yeah, was if you good can't, if you can't make it better make it worse <laughs> that's true you, you just make a sequel to it with all zombies right I did it with every scarred celebrity that's currently in Hollywood that's been disgraced or is just a mess. Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. I love it. It was epic. It was, it was, really epic. It was a lot of fun because it was the only way we, we could do anything with it because yeah, it's, it's such a great film. But And I don't regret suggesting it because Jay had never seen it. And so sometimes you just sort of suck it up. and Every now and again, yeah, we pick one where... We're, Either we know it's good and it's going to be tough, or we had no idea how good it was going to be. Yes, and was still tough. It's much easier to remake something that sucks. It, well, much easier, which is why usually <laughs> we pick movies like this one. Um. Yeah, sorry, I keep uh, destroying our childhood on on movies like this. Yes, uh, they, <laughs> right after I finished watching it, I, te- I texted Jay, I'm like another childhood memory tainted. 
<laughs> yeah, I find that too. Whenever we bust out ones that are like nostalgia filled for me, I, I end up watching them and like then I have to think about them with like a critical mind and I'm like, oh no, this is not what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've had a f- quite a few of those. Yeah. Quite a few of them. But. Now this one, I do remember being like, Something I visually I really liked because I mean I'm I'm an animation nerd I'm a nerd of about everything in pop culture really, but uh, I love my animation I love Ralph Bakshi stuff, but I knew script wise this one wasn't really there it was more about the action and the visuals. Wait, there was a script? There <laughs> there were two writers on this movie. <laughs> wow, that's two more than I thought. Yes, uh, Jerry Conway and Roy Thomas, both known for writing Conan at Marvel and both former editors in chief of Marvel Comics back in the seventies. Roy also contributed to the script of Conan the Barbarian, the film which we covered in episode forty. And Jerry Conway's got a long history in film and television uh he worked on the second conan film conan the destroyer i forgive you <laughs> <laughs> law and order a ton of those uh hercules the incredible journeys and a bazillion other things this movie of course was based on characters created by ralph bakshi and the legendary frank frazetta you know you say that and i wonder if they say characters based on i wonder if they just took their D campaign and decided to animate it <laughs> i think it was probably very much looking at the frank frazetta fantasy paintings by that point he was very well known as a fantasy painter everybody had forgotten he'd done weird comics before that mm-hmm. but i think they were looking for something because of the success of Conan the Barbarian and Clash of the Titans and things like that. Fantasy was a big thing in the early 80s, and everybody wanted a piece of that pie, And including Ralph Bakshi. I mean, he did wound up doing Lord of the Rings himself. He did it prior to this. Mm-hmm. And there's, yeah, there's some interesting trivia on that, but we'll get to that. <laughs> Ooh, I'm fascinated. Tell me more. Uh, so We'll get there. But yeah, we'll get there. Let, let me more. do it now. I'll just yeah. do it now. <laughs> you <laughs> brought it up. You got to do it. So, now you've built okay. it up. So that movie, his, his Lord of the Rings, the, the, the first first ha- half of his trilogy um, that he was going to do in two movies, cost $4 million to make. It made $30.5 million, and the studio still said, no, we're not going to bother with the second half. Which is baffling. Is absolutely baffling. Wait, wait. It made like... It's uh, gross, as in like it made more than the like what it cost it, to make. It, it or grossed like... 30, 30. million. Okay, so gross. Okay, so twenty six and a half million dollars it, it it made, not accounting marketing and all that stuff. But in the eighties, the marketing wasn't quite as excessive as it is now. So it still baffles me how studio execs go. Oh yeah, that's not worth making uh, making the second half of. Yeah, because that's a hell of a return, that especially a... on a animated feature well, especially in the 80s yeah. especially in the 80s and it's, yeah and i mean, I mean this is not pixar time the only guys who were really making big box office on animation was disney that's which right. nothing's really changed <laughs> and the thing is bakshi lord of the rings they, they made a, another piece of trivia was that it was the first animated film to actually even compete in disney's league as far as gross returns mm-hmm. so again i don't know where the studio's execs got their heads so far up their asses that like they couldn't see that this there's value in, in finishing the story mm-hmm. because it's, it's the saddest thing about that particular movie is, is is you see it and it's like well where's the rest of it right? yeah it's kind of stops about like halfway through peter jackson's trilogy right? yeah it's, it's about, halfway through two towers yeah yeah which and and as uh, a book nerd i know makes, where that is yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right but yeah as as a fan of bakshi it's one of the few movies i can't rewatch because i know it's not a complete story Mm-hmm. Right. Well, now this one, I'm not sure I'm going to rewatch again. But now that I've rewatched it again, um, but I mean, I've watched uh, watched and owned almost Bakshi's entire library because I'm just such a huge fan of the work. Yeah, I had a lot of it on VHS, yeah. and now all of it's gone. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's where most of mine were too. But but yeah, the, the man was kind of a visionary in terms of animation. Yeah, he wasn't afraid to do uh, animation for adults without Ralph Bakshi. And guys like him, we wouldn't have had heavy metal and obviously fire and ice. And I I really appreciated that. Like, some of his stuff was a little too mature for when I was a kid. But (laughs) uh, fire and ice wasn't one of them. I mean, it it certainly has that sexy appeal. fantasy girl thing. Yeah, that both uh, Frazetta and Bakshi are, are really known for. But there's no nudity. I mean, yeah, it's certainly violent. But 
I wouldn't put it in that R to X category like a lot of his library. Yeah, his early films definitely were definitely falling into that category for sure. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, he he, start, he grew, and I mean, he spent so much time with filmation too, right? So he was learning how to to work mm-hmm. in sort of that younger audience as well. Yeah, I mean, most people don't even realize they've seen Ralph Bakshi's stuff. Mighty Mouse, which the infamous snorting the uh, the, the flowers, <laughs> the poppy fields. Yes, yeah, he, he he snuck some stuff in there. Yeah, and then he was a background painter on the Amazing Spider Man as well, and he hired a ton of background painters for this particular piece because they all were trying to do their best for Zeta and with Frizetta hovering over them they're not going to disappoint over a thousand backgrounds were painted on this 10 per day yeah it's insane right? yeah and i mean for the most part the animation looks still looks pretty good there are some there's some that looks kind of rushed well it's funny because you'd see comments about this film looking kind of like he-man and they both use the rotoscope technique yeah and i also found like watching this um, so I hadn't seen this since I was like a teenager. So it's kind of like out of my brain. It was out of my brain. You mentioned, it. I was like, Oh, I, I, I kind of remember that. And then going back and watching it, I was watching it folding laundry and I kept going, what the fuck is this? What the fuck is that? Oh, swearing. Yes. No. Yes. Okay. Good. I should have checked before I just start going. But, uh, it was like one of those things where I'm like, what the fuck is going on? I totally forgot about this, but it is visually stunning, especially the backgrounds. And, mm-hmm. uh, especially early on when they have those like jungle scenes, like those are impressive shots. And because there's a lot of detail in those backgrounds there's some of the later stuff when they're doing like the ice areas where it's like, okay, cool. You know, it's, it's pretty, but like the jungle scenes are where there's so much color, so much differential, so much depth to it. And it's just so stunningly done. When you look at that and then you have these animated characters, which, you know, I, I liked the style cause there's a slight sketchiness to it, mm-hmm. but it doesn't mesh with what the rest of the movie that you're seeing. I think that's part of the problem. Is, it's is really is jarring. The, 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 it stands out in its difference. Mm-hmm. Right? It feels like the characters are rushed into the scenery or mm-hmm. forced in. Like they had all these scenes and then they were like, okay, quickly, let's do this over top. And it doesn't seem to match. But at the same time, if it matched, would we still see the characters the same way or would they be lost? Well, there's, there's some of that too because they do stand out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, anytime you like look at a background and then there's something that doesn't quite match, you're like, oh, there's a piece that's going to wind up moving at some point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're, you're just so ahead of it because whatever's going to be moving on screen is standing out like a sore thumb. Which there's also moments in there that it makes me laugh when I'm looking at the background. I don't know if you know want to talk about it but like there's the scene with the witch where she just like gets like taken down like lickety split and i'm like she charges a guy with a sword and there's like knives on the wall but she just like runs at him like what is this who who, who does that oh you know what this whole movie is like that <laughs> like they introduce <laughs> they go through this this movie and they're introducing all these characters and you think they're gonna have this these big moments and half of them just Die or go away. It just like, feels like a D and D campaign, man. Like, it really does. It, they never really get their moment. Even the lead characters don't. I mean, yeah. really, you don't really understand what's motivating any of these characters. Well, I mean, you figure the main character of of Larn is is going to be you know have the, have this heroic growth because it really is the Conan story. He's his village is attacked at the beginning of the movie. He survives but is unconscious and then manages to fight his way out escapes leaving escapes. that chick to be like completely who knows you know yeah, yeah exactly yeah very heroic dude yeah so you figure there's gonna be a heroic journey as he builds up to be this better hero type character which never really happens because they're the boba fett of the movie the dark wolf winds up being the big hero in yeah. the end which do they say his name anywhere in there never never because i was just like i was like barbarian i just kept referring to him as barbarian the entire time and then i had mm-hmm. to go look up after the fact i'm like what was that character's name when i was like figuring out what i wanted to recast this i was sitting there going like who who is that like he's not the only one but he was definitely one of the most important ones well, the thing is dark wolf <laughs> is probably the one that i know the best because there are for that a Paintings, paintings quite a few. And, and there's actually stories about him in heavy metal magazine yeah and they, they right. later kind of rejiggered the the look of him just slightly to call him the jaguar god yeah. when they started making comic books about the character and that probably had something to do with the rights of this film so they had to just do some tweaking on that yeah. but yeah by far the most recognizable character and but again there's no explanation he just sort of shows up and they don't tell you anything about him 
you don't understand his motivation for helping Lauren. Yeah. And Lauren, as I texted Jay, worst hero ever. <laughs> well, before we get on to the worst hero ever, like with Dark Wolf, I'm, he's got such a fascinating setup. Even though you don't know who he is, they don't tell you his name. But Lauren wanders into this kind of Aztec ruin thing, and he sees what are carvings of Dark Wolf. Never actually comes up. Like, hey, you were the dude on the side of that building. <laughs> Nothing ever comes up of anything. Like, there's so many times where I was like, okay, I can see where this is going. Oh, we just bypassed, I think, like 10 minutes of story. Where, where is this happening? Because even in that Aztec ruin thing, and that, like, I think this is one of the problems where I'm like, there was no script to this. Mm-hmm. You know, he's chasing uh, Tigra, and she's like trying to get away from him. He eats the berries, and then all of a sudden they're hunting together. And it's like, what just happened? Like, he ate berries on the ground that she'd placed on the ground to kind of like mislead her trail heats them and then all of a sudden they're hunting together and i'm like i think that was a case of she's she wasn't trying to get too close but just before that when she was taking the meat she's like i'm not a thief and this was a way to repay him for taking his food i mean it's weak (laughs) I, i feel like you're you're leaping or you're like you're grabbing for straws there because it it is still one of those things where he well, eats the she's berries being and then playful about it, I guess. Yeah. But it's so. It, I'm sorry. It's just it's the Tigra Lauren relationship never fucking works. No, it, it makes it, no sense. It makes no sense whatsoever. The fact that you don't there's no dialogue for like the first thirty minutes of the movie hardly. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, yeah. your main two characters don't even meet for the first half of the movie. Yeah. for first <clears throat> thirty five minutes, which I, so. which I like that they're kind of coming towards each other and you're constantly questioning going when are they going to run into each other when are they going to run into mm-hmm. each yeah. other when are they going to run into each other and when it's when lauren all of a sudden shows up and you see the temple and you're like okay they're in the same place at the same time yeah. you know but it's like i thought that was actually really well done yes mm-hmm. and i actually don't mind that i hate when they like introduce two characters right off the bat and it's like oh cool look we've uh, jumped so much story here i thought that was actually really well done oh yeah there's parts of it that are really well done it, it, again they, they, they try to tell the story through visuals and that kind of tells by the writers because they're comic book writers right? mm-hmm. so, because they're used to telling stories visually with less dialogue more so than say like a, a film script writer mm-hmm. right? so it works really well in that sense but because you're they do it that way your lead characters just seem so weak all the way through the movie because you don't know enough about them before they meet yeah you know it, this movie opens with that big opening narration to set up the world in that first attack and I feel like that narrator needs to pop in from time to time just to say, hey, that's who this dude is. That's what this, what's going on here. Some time has passed or whatever. It almost feels like those narration boxes in a comic book that just are missing. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And what a theme. That's what we said last week, too, about the narrator. <laughs> It's yeah. another one of those movies, and this drives me nuts when they have they set up a narrator at the beginning, and it just never like shows up again. But mm-hmm. it's like, okay, so we did this thing just so you kind of get the world. But it's like, was that really necessary? It's like um, the be- the biggest one of these that movie that I've ever seen do this, where it's like, why did you do that? Is the opening of Gremlins, right? Like if you watch the beginning of Gremlins, iconic movie, it has like a film noir lead in that is never mentioned again. But Gremlins makes it work because it's just so many different movies mashed into one mm-hmm. that it's funny. But in this case, it's like. If you're going to do a visual story style where you want to show visually, you do have to have an auditory aspect of it, and a narrator would be a perfect thing. And you're right about the fact they're comic book writers. They should know about the narrator boxes because Mm. they've done them, and it's like, why didn't you do this here? Especially in the 80s when that was still something that was in comics a lot that's kind of gone away these days where it's kind of been replaced by internal monologue, but... Back then, yeah, they should. That's what that stuff should have been. And if you introduce a narrator, you should close with a narrator. I've always felt like that needs to be a bookend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or yeah. if you close, if you don't close with a narrator, you meet the character who what is the narrator. Correct. Right. So it's like it's not exactly bookend, but it's like if all of a sudden you know you have a final scene where they go back to the castle with the princess and Larn. And they see the king, and the king goes, you must tell the story so we can archive it, and introduces, yeah. like, mm-hmm. you know, the scribe, and this guy comes in, and he's got the same narrative voice, and he goes, so where do we begin? Yeah. Right? Like, boom, done. Sold. Yeah. It or actually like made Conan, me... Conan, where he's a character in the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It... Well, it made me a little confused, because I could have could have sworn, and I could be wrong, but the, I, I thought the female narrator was also Juliana, but she sets herself up in the narration, so it didn't make a lot of sense. And it, it, it wouldn't make a lot of sense because she's the villainess of the film anyhow, yeah. right? So for her to tell the, the story of her downfall, 
That actually be really sense. interesting, yeah. especially if they ended because you don't see her die. If they ended with her in like a prison cell, like talking to like someone else on like a, in the prison, or or just sort of the "I will return" to exact my yeah. You figure you figure the check. mom of the big bad would have gone a little better than just falling from a cliff, but whatever. All right, I'm gonna run the trailer here, and uh, we're gonna bitch about this movie. We're gonna somewhere. hack it right to shit, <laughs> <laughs> and then make it better. Yes. From a time when the world was new. I'm the Dragon Hawks! And everything was possible. From the film creator of Wizards and Lord of the Rings comes fantasy and adventure. Suspense. Fire and ice. An unstoppable force is coming, crushing everything in its path. Necron, merciless lord of the Ice Kingdom, master of the powers of evil. Between him and world domination stand Tigra, princess of the kingdom of fire. Fire and ice. I spit on peace. Based on characters created by Ralph Bakshi and fantasy illustrator Frank Frazetta. It's a journey into a whole new world of adventure. It's the image of imagination. Fire and ice. All right, that was Ralph Bakshi's Fire and Ice, directed by Ralph, and segment director was Tom Tatarawowskis. Perfect. Yeah, nailed it. Nailed it. it. Nailed it. <laughs> Holy shit. Everybody knows I fuck up names on here all the time. It might be new, new for Tony, but it ain't new for anybody else. <laughs> this movie was budgeted at $1.2 million and made a whopping 760000 Oops. <whistles> eh, you win some, you lose some. Uh, star- this one actually, it's it's weird when you watch the movie and you see the top billing are the actors that got rotoscoped and then the voice actors. Yes. And I would that think, was confusing. I would think the voice actors should get top billing on this. So I'm going to kind of do this by their characters. Lauren was Randy Norton with the voice of William Ostrander, who was in Christine and Mulholland Drive. So the voice guy. Got, got some chops. Uh, Cynthia Leake and Maggie Roswell were Tigra. Uh, Maggie Roswell is the voice, and she's a regular on The Simpsons. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Steve Sandor was Dark Wolf. Both versions. Yes. Sometimes sometimes the dude is just the dude. He's a badass. Uh, Sean Hannon, Stephen Mendel was the voice for Necron, and Leo Gordon was Gerald. And there's a big voice cast here. There's some minor characters, but they tie into some of our previous episodes. So I'm going to mention Claire Nona was the voice of Tudor. Who is Tudor? I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> that was uh, from episode eight. Way back. Way back in episode Pre-sam. eight. Tr- trick or treat. Absolutely. And uh, there was a dude who played Mongo in this. I just wanted to mention him because his name's Big Yank. <laughs> Just let that sit there. <laughs> and and uh, Greg Wayne Ellum, he's uh, mainly known for stunts. Uh, he played another character named Paco. Again, I don't know. I don't remember him in the movie, but a lot of characters don't get actual names. But he was did stunts for Robocop, which we covered in episode 132. Uh, Poseidon, which we did in episode 69. And Weird Science, Ayo. which was episode... 83. Just because it said 69, I had to AO it. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still reeling from Big Yank. <laughs> God, I love it when people have names like that. I do, too. Yes. Every now and again, I get, I get, we get to one of these that. cast lists, and I'm like, oh, thank you. 
Thank you so much. <laughs> it's one of my favorites when you sit through like the credits in you're looking at like the gaffers and all that stuff and they have like all the they all have nicknames for some reason. Mm-hmm. I don't know why, but some of the nicknames are hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> they really are, yeah. It's the best part of the credits sometimes cuz I'm that guy. <laughs> Yeah, there's the and and they're like like little John and like sometimes they just don't make any sense at all like monkey, right? Like, well, that's because when if you have a little bit more of a minor role in a film and you're one of the crew in that regard, you can sign how you want your name to look. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah, sometimes it's case of don't let them do that, especially after they've gone for beers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> after they've done the, at the rap party, it's like, oh, what yeah. do you want your name to be? Yeah. Put a monkey. Yeah. <laughs> Big yank. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't remember what movie it was. I got to go look it up again. But there's one that there's a gaffer whose name is Bill. And it says in brackets, one-eyed Willie. Oh, no. <laughs> and, and it's just like, it's great when they do that. And it's just like. Did, did people call you one-eyed Willie? Because if so, that's that's awesome and unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> or do you only have one eye? <laughs> yeah, like is that is is your name Bill or William, and people call you and you have one eye, and so you're just one-eyed Willie? <laughs> <laughs> or is it reference back to Goonies? That's a good point. I don't know. It's one of those mysteries that you don't want really solved. No, because it's more fun to talk about it. In the it is because if he has one eye, then you just are a dick yeah. for making that joke. Yes, but if you don't know. And it's it's fair game. <laughs> yes, unless he introduces himself that way. Yeah, if yeah. he introduces also fair game. Yeah. I, have a, I have a friend who's missing his arm, and he sometimes calls himself Captain Hook when he's introducing himself to people. <laughs> but that's his choice. That's, right? that, that's and that makes it cool. That makes it okay. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he he chooses to bring attention to it to like you know ease people from being weird about it. Right. He's so the one. He who, does have one eye. He's the killer from the fugitive. There, there we go. go. It wasn't me. It was the one Armenian. Why not? <laughs> Goddamn Richard Kimball. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Back to Rat. Okay. Um, I really want to bitch about Tigra a little bit because, you know, she's at the beginning of this film. She's kind of whining that she doesn't have more to do in this kingdom. Oh, and- Right. That's, like, my biggest problem is she constantly gets captured, and she's like, why didn't all the men get the glory? And it's like, all right, bitch, you have all these opportunities. What you doing? You screaming and crying. <laughs> or being over-sexualized in this movie, like all women are in 80s mm-hmm. fantasy films, for the most part. She uses her feminine wiles to escape situations. Right? Yeah. Right. I mean, she only owns, like, two tiny little pieces of cloth to cover up her naughty bits so. yes okay which also there's the scene and i know she's wearing that sheer fabric over her bikini thing right she's got like a weird sheer bottom piece and a sheer top piece and she's wearing a bikini and then the guy rips it off and then they start leering at her and it's like she really wasn't wearing that much more <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. i was like sitting there i was like really really yeah. like exactly i was like going that made no sense whatsoever. No. <laughs> None. Like, it'd be one thing if she was, like, wearing garments and they ripped it off, and all of a sudden she's in, like, a bikini, and it's like, okay, If there was, fair. like, a setup, like, she was on the way to the pool or something, her clothing might have made a little more sense. Well, the clothing actually does make sense, because they are living in a volcano, for crying out loud. I suppose. Right? It's pretty so warm. You would be wearing <laughs> less clothing, right? Mm-hmm. Just to be comfortable, because it's not like they had air conditioning. You say that, but then we see the villain also is pretty much wearing like a women's a woman's robe and like a thong, well, and, and he's living in problem. a nice palace. That's the uh, problem. His, his skin was also blue, so he was suffering from some horrible hypothermia. Right? Like the only <laughs> the only character who's actually wearing clothes in this is the evil mother. Like everyone else is pretty much just wearing their underwear. Yeah, yes. you figure if you're coming from fire, keep going to this horrible ice kingdom. You'd uh, want to grab a sweater before you yeah. go. But yeah. even like For Larn yeah. is just wearing like underwear. Like I couldn't yeah. even call it a loincloth because it's not. It's it's literally he's wearing like tidy Three brownies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're not even tidy whiteies. Every cause... character looks like they have a really atomic wedgie. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, costume has been one of the things that will be changing, I'm sure. <laughs> I think my favorite bit of, like, it's so Ralph Bakshi, well, they've got Tiger captured, and this kind of drunk subhuman goes off to take a leak, and he comes back into frame, and he's kind of stuffing his cock back into his loincloth. <laughs> you, you don't see the member, but you know what he's doing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that, uh, that part I was actually like, all right, that's good. Although, <laughs> I think the animators had too much fun with Tigra running, I'm not going to lie. I don't know if you watched those scenes but it's like 
everything else about it's like simple animation then the boobs are just like look at it look you decided to focus on something good for you i guess <laughs> it's still a rough backshoot movie yes. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah he d- does does did have an obs- strange obsession with, he's still bo- with the body and bodily functions <laughs> right like he's not he wasn't shy about them at all no even Nothing when they weren't appropriate that. to fit into him in, 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 they didn't make sense co- contextually he had to fit them in well out of the things that don't make sense in this movie that is the least among them yes <laughs> <laughs> of the dog men though as they kind of reference them because i don't know what to call them they're kind of like orcs they're under humans they call them the, the uh they dogs. were i i learned later on in the movie they're called subhumans subhumans yeah so like the subhumans First off, we have that scene where the guy's drunk. Where did the booze come from? Again, they're not wearing anything, and they're not. It's not like they have. Backpacks where were they keeping it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Where did like he's super drunk? What was he drunk on? Were they eating like rotten fruit they found? Like what's going See, on? See, that would have been funny, and it would have made sense. Tigra seems to know her fruit, and if yeah. you know she roofied them. <laughs> See, that, that would, would be great. Yes, that would agreed. Be great. Yeah. <laughs> but instead, it's Shot just that like, down. Um, and then she's trying to cut a chain with a knife, and it's like, girl, girl you you live in a lava kingdom. You've probably dealt with chains because there's no way you'd have ropes there. Like, <laughs> you should know that this stone knife isn't going to work on your like chain that also they pulled out of their assholes, <laughs> probably <laughs> literally. Okay, now you got me talking about knives and fucking Lorne and his knife that he never loses and never uses. <laughs> that's just perpetually tied to his belt yeah <laughs> no they take it out at one point it's just a sheath when he gets captured that's a good point that's the only time that we're where it, it, it but it, someone else had to take it out for him it's yeah. like he forgot it was there yeah oh when he's w- being chased and he's wildly <laughs> waving his knife at the black dogs and there's okay there's yeah. a few moments there's a few moments for the most yeah. part but the thing about him is he uses a weapon then he leaves it <laughs> he never continues he never actually retains a weapon and it's not because he loses it. It's because he doesn't pick it back up. You know, <laughs> not I'm, once does he pick up his weapon again. Technically, I think the knife is the only weapon that's his because even the mace is a weapon he picked up at the beginning. But why mm. wouldn't you keep it? Yeah, I don't right? understand like, why he, like, he never uses it and then like drops it for the javelin. Or it's like, wh- if you're going to do that, why don't you take the mace, stick it in your belt, throw the javelin, and then keep running? You know, it makes sense when it's like, okay, he's being chased. He throws the axe or he throws a javelin. He doesn't retrieve a javelin yeah. because he's still being chased. I'll give him credit for that. But again, it's like he runs a dude through with a sword with the guy's own sword and leaves the sword in a dude and just walks away. And it's like, dude, like weapon up. You know, this is going to be a problem. (laughs) Yeah. It's like a trope of every action film. You recover a weapon. You keep it until you lose it again. You don't just leave it behind. I, I kept thinking, at least for the first half of this film, when the subhumans have kidnapped Tigra from the kingdom after the whole false negotiations. Thing, yeah, on, yeah the, the envoy thing. And I kept thinking the jungle was on her side. <laughs> like, they, these subhumans just kept getting knocked off the further they got in to the jungle when they were trying to chase her after she made her first escape like she's hiding in that log that guy sticks his arm in the log and this thing's attached to his arm and big things are coming out of the water and everything's trying to eat the subhumans but not her yeah she, she seemed to be like magically protected somehow yeah maybe she was or maybe it's because they stank uh, there we go. Yeah, they're, they're they're more appealing, and that makes again makes sense. So if, if you fill it out, it, it can if make sense. If you flush sense. it out, like yeah. the mm-hmm. reason that maybe she's not as appealing is if she was a princess, she'd probably be covered in like floral perfumes incense and, and perfumes. So she might yeah. not be appealing to animals. Whereas these things, which smell like sweat and gross to us, smell but like food. Would smell like food to all of that, like these animals, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like to her, she smells like maybe a flower, but like to because of all the other subhumans smell like they meat. They smell like food. Hmm. That, I, I like that theory. The film too much credit, but I think we can make it work. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's just me overanalyzing, but it's like... But that, it's well done. No, we're trying to help Jerry Conway, Roy Thomas, and Ralph Bakshi yes. here. <laughs> we're trying to make their movie. We're giving them explanations like. for that's things right. that... Which, unless maybe they thought of it and just, again, they're visual artists, so they don't, they don't feel the need to explain yeah. that. Two editors in chief of Marvel. I want. We want our no prize right now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> do they still do the no prize? No, no. I didn't think so. Well, but that's or yes. I don't know. 
it, there was no prize. <laughs> so yes and no. Yes and no. There we go. <laughs> What's the no prize for something uh, that not was? In the loop? Yeah, for this was something Stanley had started. The no prize was when there was some sort of gaffe in a comic book. A fan noticed, and rather than point it out, the fan would get the no prize for f- coming up with an explanation for it. Oh, okay. So that's what we just did. I like it. <laughs> we'll probably do it a few more times. Probably. We're going to have a whole shelf of no prizes. <laughs> <laughs> Which will just look like an empty shelf. <laughs> <laughs> you just put little like plaques up. It'd be great. <laughs> Ironically, they used to send out, I might even have one somewhere, and it was an envelope that said no prize that was empty. <laughs> <laughs> It's genius. That's, that, I mean, that just goes back to Stan and his genius as, of engaging his his fans, right? But but we're not talking about Stan. We've done that already. <laughs> yeah, we did an episode on that too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this movie. I'm sorry. I just can't. Flaw after flaw after flaw. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, it, again, it looks it's, great. It's a lot of action pieces, and they're trying to create segments that look like Frank Frazetta scenes mm-hmm. without coming up with enough of the dramatic beats to set up that story. The Jackie Chan did. Yeah, well, I mean, they, we came in near the end of it. It's essentially this mustache twirling villain wants to control the world, and he controls ice and glaciers, which is a hell of a cool power, really. It is. Uh, it, except for the fact that it looks like he's orgasming at the very beginning trying to control it. Yes. Yeah, orgasming and in slight pain at the same yeah. time, so I don't know. Orgasm. But getting, getting off on the pain of... Yeah. of the magic of it all. I, I got the feeling he was some sort of like uber telekinetic because he was really the only one that had kind of any real powers. I mean, there was that witch, I guess. But Yeah, but she didn't really expl- it, it, it sort of show any power, right? She was she was killed too quick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the, she, again, another character that wasn't developed. It was set up and then boom, gone. Mm-hmm. And it could have been a very good arc or something. And then all of a sudden she comes back from the death and is like, avenge me. And it's like, who are you? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Who are you, skeleton woman? Yeah. <laughs> Why am I avenging you? Like, <laughs> like aren't you dead? Why are you still you talking to me? Tell me information. Me? Sure. <laughs> I'll do that. Fingers crossed. Just to let you know, I'm fucking useless. Yeah. <laughs> Avenge you. You were going to like sell Tigra back to Necron. You're not exactly a, a nice person. Exactly. <laughs> but again, another character you thought was going to have a little more impact with her big giant and really nothing. She was, she was just another throw thing to throw character. in there. Which is And funny. another segment that was directly pulled from Conan, yeah. the, the witch scene. Yeah. But it, it's funny because there's so many elements that aren't flushed out well enough. And I know that it was like the, it's 83, right? If I remember correctly, mm-hmm. off the top of my head. It came out in 83, but technically it's got a runtime of an hour and 19 minutes. So it's not even like it actually... It's so short, it wouldn't actually qualify to be entered into Sundance. Like, <laughs> it, it's so short that it actually is, it's actually 11 minutes short to be qualified as a feature length film. It, mm-hmm. It's actually too short because there is technically a cutoff at an hour 30 to be considered feature length. Mm-hmm. And so, which I, I know is kind of imposed later, but it's still one of those things where it's like, it's so short, but there's so many stories. Too long to be a short, too short to be a feature. <laughs> right? But it, it's like, but there's so many points where it's like, well, they should have flushed it out more. They should have flushed mm-hmm. it out more. And it's like, but why didn't they? Yeah, they had the room. They had the room. It's not like this is a two-hour movie and we're like, man, they really need to flush that out more. Mm-hmm. No, this movie, it's like, you could fit this. You could cut a little bit out of it, which you shouldn't because there's already so much cut out of it that it doesn't make sense. But it's like you could cut this and actually have this fit an hour time slot on a TV like programming. Mm-hmm. Where Just an extra 10 minutes would have gone so far in this movie. Right? Yeah. And it's like, it could be done in like 30 second scenes all throughout mm-hmm. to like just push little things, even little ex- explanations. Even like we were saying about the perfume, if she did a thing where she smells herself and she, she goes, oh, I smell like a flower. Like she just like smells herself and she goes, oh, and she like, she figures it out, you know, and then like, so she knows that she can evade the animals and like it gives the audience a clue and all it needed was one line of dialogue and like two yeah. or three seconds, right? And it's like, you could pull so many little scenes in that would like make more sense. Oh yeah. Like, the fact that we have characters who we don't know their names. Yeah. If she's just rough enough with them to draw a little bit of blood, you get that blood in the wind yeah. <laughs> that attracts all that fauna. Yeah. Well, and, and even that's the thing is, so we know she's studying, so we, they could have played on that. Her character was so flat, but had such a great intro. Like when they bring her in and she's with her tutor and it's like, you have to study. It's like, 
okay, cool. That's a cool shot. Then she complains about all the men fighting for glory, and she doesn't get that. All right, you've got a character. You've got her set up. Like, you have such a great intro for her. And then she becomes a damsel in distress. She never exudes that knowledge, other than the fact that she knows what berries are edible. But it's like, and even that is, again, us, I guess, no prizing it. I'm going to use that now. I like that. Um, (laughs) You know, that's us doing that. But it's so much where it's like, she could have explained it. it. It's her having dialogue points that would have made that more interesting. They totally could have Arya Starked her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? It, 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 so she's not interested in the things that she's learning, but she's also very interested in, in, in the physical combat arts, which would make her far more interesting and useful through the rest of the film if she, if she was well, at even, least semi-competent in Even combat. if we keep her more to this version of the character, instead of a physical presence, she's a very mental one. Right. Like, she's escaping all the time because she's really good at MacGyvering herself out of these situations. Mm-hmm. You know, she's, she's way smarter than her captors. Well, and I, the fact that she keeps getting like recaptured every five fucking minutes by the 10, me 10 under humans, which are apparently 50, which I know I, like that line. I was just like, what? There's 50 of them. I'm pretty sure I've seen 10. <laughs> well, they just sort of like, they split one up into dies five, and five more appear kind of thing happened there. Right. It, well, I mean, it, right? at least initially it, somewhat made sense like that initial group that caught her was getting picked off by the forest but there was that other group that had been chasing Larn after he'd escaped from the initial battle and been tracking him so that Which all comes be a back battalion. together yeah so there's this battalion that's been kind of split up and they're going to know what each other's doing or I don't well know, they wouldn't though you would um think. but that's the thing they're reporting in via the smoke right oh yeah. that's right yes so yeah. it's like they may not be intelligent, but they are reporting to someone who is intelligent. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. yeah, and you know what? You could have a great scene there where you have Necron saying, Why the fuck are you chasing this runaway? Mm-hmm. Right? We have something well, more important for you to do. Go find the princess. Right? It wasn't uh or, it wasn't Necron, it was, it was Juliana. Juliana. Yeah. But yeah. It, again, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, we have a scene with the fire. We have two scenes with the fire. Or the scene where she kills the one guy and she hangs him, which was pretty cool. I liked that scene. Mm-hmm. But it's like if that scene started with just like two or three of them there and it's like, all right, your fate will be the same. And since you seem to be incompetent, I've brought aid. And all of a sudden these other guys like show up, right? Like that makes a lot more sense. And that would like mm-hmm. flush that out a lot more. Oh, bring in one of those, one of the subhumans that actually can speak the one, like, like the, un, like the envoys, right? Mm-hmm. You should have one of those guys leading them, not just these barely functional cannon fodder pieces mm-hmm. trying to run it because that's, that, that's, the biggest well, problem with them is they're not intelligent. They're, they have I a think certain... that's what Ponytail was, the guy who killed the witch, because he's the only one of the underhumans who's semi-different enough to be like, oh yeah, that's Ponytail. Look he seems to understand some some strategy, I yeah. think. I, I, and, and yeah, and he's, certainly he's the most intelligent of an unintelligent bunch, yeah. but I think you could have made them a lot more effective by when you, like, just like... I bet saying. you that dude was Big Yank. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, it's so a Big Yank, Ponytail. Yeah. But, it, I mean, like I said, it's it's a, his name is Manga, so that sounds like a big, important yeah, subhuman right? dude. Well, no, that's, so. that's the, the witch's son. The, 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 the one that gets killed? No, no. that's, that's uh, Atwa. Atla? Oh, okay, I got that one mixed up. It's yeah. I didn't catch him anyhow. Um, I did. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, like, it's like what Tony was saying is if you, if you have Juliana saying, okay, well, we're going, we're sending you reinforcements and I'm sending you some leadership, and then you have one of the purple robed sort of mid humans, <laughs> sub mid. Okay, I see what you're doing here. Yeah, so we have the mid human, uh, mid human sort of leading them and, and providing them with guidance to to help find Tigra and get it under control. Then you have if you set it up to sort of a negotiation with the witch who I didn't mm-hmm. cast. Um, I should have, but I didn't. Um, yeah, I didn't either. I didn't even think about casting her. Yeah, because she's had such a, such a short bit in the movie. It wasn't... Well, that's a, the, the thing, is we got to give these characters yeah. motivation for existing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the action sequences work fairly well, but we've got to make our characters actually feel like they're doing something within those scenes, because the only one that winds up being really, truly heroic in this movie is the character that doesn't get named, Dark Wolf. Yes. And you see him at the very beginning of the movie. Yeah, initially, because I'm very familiar with Frank Rosetta paintings, I'm like, is Death Dealer in this movie? I don't remember him in this movie. Because it's very much the Death Dealer painting. Oh, for sure. Yeah. But, but it's Dark Wolf. Yeah, and I think that's meant to be just a little bit of an Easter egg for Frazetta fans, yes. thinking that Death is watching over these big battles and is here to collect its souls, where it's really just 
this this dude from the outskirts looking for some kind of revenge that uh, that, that, people that also know. is not flushed out no yeah. right because like, because there's a point there where gerald's talking to him and like, like he knows him but it mm-hmm. but again there's no explanation of the relationship no i i'm guessing whatever kingdom he's from had fallen and he was viewed as some sort of god that would explain all of the carvings of him but I guess there there would have been some kind of alliance at some point, or maybe he was a god that we just never were told about. Well, his overcompetency would exp- would would kind of fit into godhood, or at least some sort of magical being right? mm-hmm. or empowered being. I just kept calling him barbarian rage. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, that works too. Um, <laughs> Angry dude. Yeah. Um, I swear, this has been I've been meaning to mention this for a little while. The other th- one of the other things that really, really uh, jarred me in this movie was the lack of sense of distance. Mm-hmm. If that makes any sense at all, because there's the, the scene where they have to take a ship to get to the ice mm-hmm. kingdom, but then all of a sudden, Darkwell shows up like in like minutes after Lauren shows. Oh up. yeah, he's just everywhere at and once. instantly. And, and uh, then all of a sudden, they're that's right back at the thing. Fire Kingdom. Like, 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 it seems like like no time at all has passed, and they're back at the Fire Kingdom. Yeah, no, but at the same time with that one, you know, the princess gets captured, she gets taken back. There, he's like, okay, you're injured, we need to heal you. We're gonna go back this way. So I almost feel like they're even distances apart from that point, and it's just instead of showing them traveling, mm-hmm. it's them all of a sudden. Okay, we're back at these two points, right? Which that's to me how that would roll, but it it's still like it's yeah still you're jarring right. when you're watching mm-hmm. it. Yeah. And I got the feeling that the ice kingdom was constantly moving within that glacier, so it was covering distance while it was moving because the glacier is the main force of attack. And how the did kingdom. a boat even get to the like to the middle of a glacier? Is my other yeah, problem. Well, well, you can set that up with with Necron and and, and his ability to, to manipulate the, the 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 ice and stuff like that. Is that you could see him open up a passageway up to. Uh, up, up and mm. that would be really mm. cool look really freaking great on screen too yeah right is to have him sort of part the red sea but it's the white sea um, yeah i wish the there would have been a little scene at the beginning when we're in fire keep and maybe we saw somebody handling the firehawks just to set those those things up that we're going to use them later as a big kind of air force attack thing well they kind of do we know. We never see him until right at the end of the you film. See, you see them right no, at the beginning. When, when, see them right right near the beginning. Yeah, when Tigra gets taken, he, uh, Gerald Release says, the Firehawks. Yes. They'll never see them in the thick jungle. They're yeah. useless. They can't find their own yeah. nest. Fair. I'm just yeah. going to quote it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so they, they do... They, they, one thing they actually did set up in advance is it was the release of the Firehawks. And Fire I completely Hawks forgot about yeah. it because I was so used to nothing being set yeah. up. <laughs> 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 they did set them up, but it would be cool to also see like a little bit more or to see like another character come out of that because the second like the firehawks go and they get in there and they have all the rocks and arrows and like main characters only from here on yeah because it's like every single one of those gets killed and yeah. then they fly out on one that was downed i didn't i didn't yeah. understand that part there was a dead one and then it wasn't dead yeah i, that, I saw that too and, and then it's dead again yeah and then it's dead again and it's like does Tikar actually have like necromatic abilities that we don't <laughs> know about like maybe like that's what she's studying who knows but like Again, this feels sometimes like a D and D campaign to me, and I play way too much D and D. But it's just like you know, everybody's I, rolling twenties except yeah. for Lauren. Yeah. <laughs> Lauren's rolling tens. All right, he's okay. He's, he's doing okay. The occasional <laughs> one, the occasional it. twenty, but like you know, the occasional twenty being when he throws that axe back at the dude and just gets him square in the chest, and it's like, cool, good job, buddy. <laughs> but like, other than that, it's like it does feel like a D and D campaign, except for. It feels low fantasy in a high fe- fantasy setting, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Because I don't know if, if you guys play or D&D or not. It's been a long time for it's, us. Yeah, a long time. So, like, the difference between high fantasy and low fantasy is, like, high fantasy is your um, Lord of the Rings. Magic's everywhere. There's mm-hmm. magical items everywhere you turn. There's all sorts of magical beings. Low fantasy is where it's, like, there's some magical beings, but not as much. There's not, like, it's not quite as magical, but there is still some. This feels more like low fantasy, where mm. it's like, we have one magical dude, and that's pretty much it, right? And, like, there's no magical items or anything. There's a witch, but she seems kind of more crazy than a witch. <laughs> and, like, yeah. you know, you're not quite sure with her and her son slash lover thing, which was kind of weird. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> you know, but it's definitely one of those things where it's it's low fantasy, and which is fine, but... You know, they needed to build the characters a lot more to make it work. And they really, 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 really did a piss poor job with Tigra. Yes. Yeah, I mean, character-wise, 
this terrible. Lauren, I'm okay with like the the not a hero. It's very reminiscent of Big Trouble in Little China, mm-hmm. or even if you watch Indiana Jones. Technically, Indiana Jones, the entire plot would happen without him, whether he was there or not. He doesn't yeah. really do anything, right? So it's like it's one of those where it's like I'm okay with that because I always found that to be an interesting character. It's more interesting than the hero where everything goes right. But like, and even if you think about the original uh, Star Wars, the first half Luke is useless. Mm-hmm. It's not until like he gets in an X wing that he's actually useful of any kind. But it's Obi Wan is the like is pretty much uh, Dark Wolf. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I right? get the but feeling it- Dark Wolf is just like okay. Now Necron is distracted by these two idiots. <laughs> and I can That's go in try. and be a badass and clean house. <laughs> and I'm perfectly fine with setting it up that way. Right? <laughs> but with, with, big, with Big Trouble, they set it up very clearly that he wasn't really all that heroic. He happens to get lucky sometimes. He, he rolls a 20. Jack? No, Jack does nothing. He's useless. He's useless. Yeah. Go back and rewatch it. They he knocks it. himself out for the major conflict. <laughs> yes, that's what I mean. But they said at the very beginning that he's, that he's useless. Right, that he's got he's, he's got an inflated sense of his own abilities, mm-hmm. right. right? And I feel like that's what with Lauren as well is because even then he wasn't on the wall; he took the place of someone who bailed. Yeah, yeah. Right? right? Like someone else fled and was like, "I can't do this." He took that dude's mace, yeah. got up on the wall, and he's and like, "Why well, wasn't he up on the wall to begin yeah, with?" Yeah, and the guy's like, "Well, I guess you're here. Join your brother." And it's like, "Oh, he has a brother," and then he goes stand next to some dude who also isn't really drawn differently than anyone else on the wall. Mm-hmm. Like Lauren's the only one who looks remotely different. You're like, "Oh, look, main character." I think yeah. everybody in that village was related. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they shared but, one mother. All right. Yeah, but I, I said set it up better, and then I'm totally fine with Lauren being the reluctant, not quite a hero. Mm. Right? He's got heroic tendencies, but he doesn't quite make it there. Yeah. Because he did look different there, I kind of got the feeling he had a bit of a higher standing within the village. Like, he's certainly not on, on a kingdom level of, you know, the son of a king or whatever, but son maybe noble, he's maybe. important in this, you know, big fish and small pond kind of scenario. Yeah, and that has to be set up that, it, that he, like, like he's he's like their 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 best hunter or something, right? To, yeah. To, to sort of... Although, you know, why he's not up on the wall, but maybe that's not what his function was. Or not even that. Maybe he's too young. And then they realize, well, if we're all going to die, we might as well bring everybody in, right? I did get the feeling he was probably a younger person, for sure. Like, that might be why he also looks different is because he's still allowed to have the youthful hair and he's not like into the art like he's not reached that adulthood yet so mm-hmm. he's still you know because he has that really long braid and it's like who knows maybe they're maybe their traditions are you grow your hair until your manhood and then you have to cut it off kind of thing right and because mm-hmm. that's and these are cool things that you could put build in is it's mm-hmm. just part of that lore yeah and then you could have a scene later where he go he cuts his own like ponytail off right mm-hmm. like you could build that in to like when he's like okay Right before he takes the Firehawk and he, or what they call them? Dragon Dragon Hawk. Hawk. Yeah. Dragon Hawks, yeah. Dragon Hawk. And he like cuts his ponytail off and it's like, you know, that's a moment. And you could easily build that in to make it interesting. Without taking up much screen time at all. Yeah, mm. next to none. Yeah. And it's just like, you could easily do that. And then I guess you're changing the character model for animation. It's a little bit harder to like then portray him. But you would have growth of a character, especially mm. if he like, you know, has a moment where he's explained to her about his like his regret of his people or something. And it's like, you flesh out his dynamic with Tigra, which then makes those characters seem to fit a little bit better and not like this. Oh, you guys are in love now. What happened? How'd that, how do we get there? We, yeah. we got there somehow. And I'm not quite sure. It's yeah. yeah it happens awfully quickly in this thing. Uh, you know, if maybe he'd actually rescued her at some point, <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> but no, that kind of just happens. Or bonding and... moments over like fire. He doesn't have to rescue her yeah. for there to be a moment. But, like, if he's there and he's explaining who, why he's in the jungle and, like, you know, maybe he doesn't have to save her, but he's, like, they have bonding moments Yeah, while they're, they're both hiding. victims of this same kingdom. Right? This, this Necron dude. And so it's, like, it could you could easily flesh out both characters by doing that, having mm. conversation moments. And I feel like, again, they spent so much time trying to build up this visual element of action, they forgot about characters. And, yeah. like, they just assumed the characters would be built along the way and it just didn't happen. Yeah, and you're going to need these personal development moments, especially if you're going to go live action like we're going to do yeah. in our remake. Exactly. Uh, you know, I, sorry, you got me thinking about Lauren. You guys were sitting there talking. I was listening, but I was also thinking about Lauren. And because it, in this movie, what he's really good at is running. <laughs> right? He's really good at running. Maybe he is a hunter. Exactly. Yeah. So, the, and then you guys, you were talking about sort of how that relationship develops, and you could have 
some time spent on how he's really good at staying away from trouble. Right? So, so he, he kind of has a good idea as to where the troops would go, so he takes them a different route. Right? And then that would feed into the smarter mid-human sort of figuring out what's going on. You could have some really fun stuff happening there as far as how, he, how they get ca- caught up again. Right? Mm-hmm. We'll call him Mongo. Yeah, big yeah. <laughs> big, <yank. laughs> big yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, yeah they, so sorry, I'm, I'm 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 sort of figuring out how to make things work at the same time here because I think I think we're work. all doing that because there's so much wrong with this movie. Yeah. It's easier to talk about how to fix it, mm-hmm. and then to like really sit there and pick it apart because the only thing that this movie has really going for it is it's visually stunning. Yeah, I, and I don't think any of us really have a problem with like the action sequences per se. No. It's just how we get there. Yeah. It's the in-betweens. Yeah. And even then, I actually really like the fact that the main battle, the final battle, isn't between Lorne and I forgot his name temporarily, and I have it written down here. Necron. Necron. Like, I like the fact that it's Dark Wolf and Necron. It was a bit of a surprise to me, even though it's it, it reminds me thinking. of the, and I know this came out shortly beforehand, Vader and Obi-Wan on mm. the Death Star, right? Like, you don't see Luke face Vader until... Uh, their first face-off is in Empire, right? But it's like, you don't see the main character face-off against the big bad. And I like that. And I think that's also why Star Wars worked so well, is you do not have that big fight between the main hero, mm-hmm. which is Luke, or in this case, Lauren. I think it actually is a really great story technique that's different, right? Where it's the mentor. And in this case, the mentor did kick ass and was able to like kind of come over like beat the like the the mental block the mm. necron had which i also like and i think he is a telepath yeah. and he's learned that he can control maybe ice or something or maybe uh this is going to be lame but like i don't know if you ever guys watched avatar last end Ender- airbender cartoon not m night Shyamalan, because <laughs> screw that but <laughs> um, you know it's like maybe he's a water kind of like he has control over water which is mm. why he can control people because we're made up of so much water which is why when he's like stop he's able to control people I like that. I like that very much, yeah. and it explains his abilities, and that he's not super powerful, but it allows him a certain that's, amount of that's control. That's like quite a powerful ability yes. as a whole, moving glaciers and stuff. Yeah. Granted, you know, with all this stuff that's kind of happening with these three main characters of Tigra and, and Larn and Dark Wolf, I got the feeling Firekeeper would have probably still won this. It's like, we're getting our ass kicked, unleash the volcano which they inevitably do anyway. That's really the only reason they won. <laughs> yeah. Which is why I think he, like, they could have taken him anyway. I think they could have taken, or I don't know if they could have taken Necron if they had released the volcano and Necron didn't go, but they can definitely beat the glacier, mm-hmm. right? Like, they can beat the gla- glacier, but if the glacier had help and wasn't just a natural disaster, because natural disaster versus natural disaster, they function, they they cancel each other out, right? Yeah. But, like, if Necron was there and able to push, whereas they only just are able to pull levers and open the doors to the lava, you know, it's, like, it's one thing to open the doors, but it's another thing if, like, you had someone who can, like, lift the lava over top of the glacier, mm-hmm. whereas, like, I think Necron could have just pushed the glacier over the lava, which then just makes the lava turn to stone. Yeah. Right. Well, then, right. and then you have the, the added, added effect of, of melting water, which can then become a torrent of water as you move forward, as it moves mm. forward to the heat. First, it turns right. to steam, obviously, but then eventually it's going to turn into a rush of water. Yeah. I don't think enough importance was put on how important this move was for Necron. They're trying to at least a political maneuver by sending envoys and secretly kidnapping the daughter, Tigra, to negotiate the surrender of this kingdom because they didn't really want to fight them. Well, no, because fire is the natural enemy of ice, I mean, right? Necron, certainly, he, he's, he's a sociopath. He didn't care. He would have rather just had the fight. Yes. But this was more of a political stratagem. So it makes me wonder how much of this territory or even this planet that Necron's already taken over. Yeah, and I'd like to see more of that, right? Mm-hmm. Because you show him t- t- uh, taking over... Lauren's village, and you could sort of set up the whole Dark Wolf stuff mm-hmm. as and well. We should see some of Gerald's allies as well yeah. from neighboring kingdoms that are They're all taking on refuge. the other side, and or have taken refuge. Yes, because so that, 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 that was what they talked about. Is a lot of people had gone to the Fire Kingdom to for like safe haven because mm-hmm. they were the last like bastion of that. But it's like it'd be interesting to see not only that. Or even if that was more stated in the intro, Mm -hmm. you know, like, because you don't want to spend too much time focusing on things that have already passed. But like if the narration was done in a different way where it explained more of that and you did see more characters or if you saw people like if you got to see the people of the Fire Kingdom and saw that they were a very hodgepodge of different communities. Right. Mm -hmm. Where it's like or even if like you have a moment where the king is looking over 
like the streets which are just filled with like tents or something where it's like the kingdom just can't support the amount of people yeah there. there's there's this tent city kind of thing yeah yeah right with a bunch of refugees and it's like so he's a re- he's like this host to the refugees and he's like and he's even doubting he's like we have the lava but i don't know if that'll be enough have that doubt there where he's like i think we can we can do something but it wouldn't be enough which is why he's trying to strive for peace and not war because he like if he has a moment where he's like i don't think we can win this Mm -hmm. you know like even if we have all the people you know he has all these subhumans which you know aren't smart but maybe they're more in abundance than like you know, maybe he can create the subhumans. That'd be yeah. interesting if you saw yeah. him, like, or the mom can create the subhumans, or the subhumans are created from the dead. I was, I was just going to go there because they have that pit of dead people that yeah. they throw Tigra and her brother into. What if the witch is as Juliana's sister? That'd be a great idea, too. Yeah. Uh, which was Rolio, by the way. And maybe there could be some... The witch Rolos. Uh, Rolio, sorry. Rolio. Yeah. Rolos. Witch Rolio. Mm. Rolos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this episode brought to you by Rolo. <laughs> now give us our fucking money. <laughs> or just give us Rolos. Yes. <laughs> We're easy. <laughs> <laughs> just like a pack. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, or you know what? Even special packaging with Invasion of the Remake on it. Sell it, please. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Limited edition. That's right. Oh, mine's got to have peanut butter in it. But no, it it would be interesting to do that. And I honestly think maybe she is. But again, they don't flush out the characters enough to explain that. You yeah. know, and because we know she has some sort of grudge and some sort of in with Necron. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, there's something there. So it's like, maybe she was betrayed by him. Maybe she was the sister or her, his aunt. Maybe she it was, maybe, if not related, maybe she was, like, his advisor who then he he cast off. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, we don't know. Yeah. yeah, if there was some sort of personal connection where there's a motivation, if she turned over Tigra, maybe she could be invited back into the kingdom and, and win back her favor. Mm-hmm. Oh, total payoff. Figuring it out. Um she gets cast out because of her mongoloid son. Oh. She refuses to give up her son, who's clearly, I hate to say it, but, but in this culture, he would be considered deficient. So, Well, if she's more of a highborn and this Maybe this she son... partook in the subhumans for Ooh, fun. Oh, yeah. And, that, and yeah, so she's been cast out. And, now, and you're right. Now she's trying to find a way to go, to go home. Mm-hmm. And that's Dark. where the son came from, is he's part her and part yeah. subhuman. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, then it, and then it explains a whole bunch of stuff. Right? Yeah, and that explains why they kill him too, because he's ni- of neither. Oh, we should at least see something other than a knife in his back. Like oh. a big I did like that when he came in, and he was just—it's a good like... fake out. Uh, I would have liked to see at least a little bit of a fight, and then we cut away, not knowing how that fight's going to end. And then he comes in the door, and we still get that scene of him falling over. Now we know how that fight ended. Yeah, but yeah, you can even have him cut, take out a couple of them. Yeah, and then I run mean, to tell his mother. Big, He's right. strong, but overwhelming numbers. But at the same time, from the way that she talked about him, maybe he wouldn't fight. Maybe he's a gentle soul. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, even though he is strong and he can break the chains and he does stuff, he lifts things. He doesn't fight things. Mm-hmm. Right? Because yeah. she does comment about that. So the fact that he got killed, I was like, ah, I'm not surprised. Right? Mm-hmm. Like, it wasn't... It, even even that moment where he came in, I'm like, how's he still alive? Like, I'm surprised they kept him alive. You know, and then when he dies, I'm like, oh, okay. That's fine. All right. That makes sense. Because him doing that, it wasn't even like a subtle fake out because the fact that she had this big speech beforehand about how gentle he was. I'm like, Mm -hmm. you're sending him this gentle soul who can barely communicate to a group of not gentle souls who can barely communicate to transfer a message from one party to another. I feel like this is going to be a bad game of telephone that ends badly for someone. Yeah. Well, if he's part of both races, maybe he's able to communicate back and forth that way. And that you can explain that, right? Then, right. then it makes sense. Yeah. Right. But that, that's us explaining it. But watching the movie, I, well, like that was a thought that went through my head. I'm like, sure. We can put it in our movie, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think we've actually got a pretty good angle with her now. Like the whole that whole scene kind of works now. And it explains why she's mad at Necron, but why she would rather negotiate with him than, like, mm-hmm. aid. And then she's like, avenge me, because she's being killed and her son's being killed, you know? And it's like, there's definitely a lot more to play with with her than what little there was. Sure, and you, we, we, can, we can add a scene of uh, moments with Tigra and Atwa to establish that he's more of a gentle soul. Yeah. And that's easily done. Sit by a fire and he's being sweet or something. Yeah brings her flowers who knows yeah this could be something just quick and this big intimidating dude is just a big 
kitty cat. <laughs> yeah. It totally, it, 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 it totally makes that make sense. Without yeah. adding a whole bunch of, again, a whole bunch of screen time, the, the, the character then doesn't become a throwaway character. It's, she serves a purpose. Yeah. Now, and we've, I think we've established that Tigra is going to be more of a manipulator, whether it's with a, her physical form or she's MacGyvering her way out of situations. I'd rather her get away from the physical form. Like, I like the one where she's yeah, like, I, she realizes that that aged after. well. <laughs> that did not age well. It doesn't look good and it doesn't no. play to the rest of the character the one time she does it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it was a funny ish kind of thing and it could be done comedical in like a, you know, a live action, but I feel like it was very fan servicey, and it. Oh, was, there's so much with there, yeah. she is entirely fan. Oh, yes, hundred percent. Yeah, but it's like if we're gonna recast this and we're gonna do this live action, like I would rather her be able to outthink others, and mm-hmm. I think it'd be more interesting t- for her not to always get captured. And she does MacGyver her way out, which I do like. But the fact that she knows she can MacGyver her way out, so mm-hmm. if she gets captured, she's not worried about it. Yeah, yeah. I think she's the planner. She's the one. That's telling Larn's strategy. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. if if she'd been given half a chance with her kingdom's armies and stuff, she would have been a hell of a commander. Yeah. Well, and you sorry, I, I'm going back to a thought that I had while we were talking about Necron's power and his ability to control water. I was thinking, what about if near the end during that final battle, she discovers that she actually does have the, that power to control the lava. Or to control the, or to control fire. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Right. So, it, it, it's, it's not something that that she's aware of, but through her proximity to Necron, it it sort of it flips that switch, giving her that. Um, and then it becomes fire and ice. Her. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Right. But you know, I also there's there's one scene and it bothered me because you don't see what the fuck happened. But she gets like Lauren is looking for her in the ice palace and he's calling her name and she's about to call out. And then Juliana grabs her mouth. And then the next scene, she's standing there with a knife and then Juliana's running to her son. And I'm like, what, 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 yeah. what? <laughs> like, did Juliana just be like, go to him. And it's just like, and then it goes to her son. It's like, what? There's no rationale. There. No, there There's should no, be like, the, there should be a conflict between those two. For <clears> sure. And maybe that's where she figures out she can control the fire. And then Juliana's like, oh, shit, and runs away. Right. Like, that'd be interesting to find out that yeah. like, maybe she can control fire because there's torches everywhere. She just pulls the fire from the torches. And she's like, she's just as baffled. Yeah. Juliana's like, uh, oh, screw can, this. You can have a really cool scene where Juliana yeah. has a knife to her. And Throw me in the garbage pit, will you? Yeah. <laughs> I, another Star Wars correlation there. Just yeah. pointing that out. Um but you can have that the cool thing what? where she pulls the like almost like a laser beam of fire from a torch and that melts the knife. Mm. Right? It, it, it would look really fucking cool too. Um, mm-hmm. Or makes the knife so hot that she has to drop it, and then yeah. she can pick, and then she picks up a hot knife that's still hot. Yeah, because maybe just as Necron seems to be immune to the cold, he may be blue, but he's somehow immune to hypothermia. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe she can pick up a hot knife, like she's immune to heat. Yeah. Oh, that'd be a cool idea. Yeah. Do you think Gerald, her father, is aware? that she has these innate abilities and just is keeping it from her? No, I I, I think that he thinks it's going to be his son. Mm. Oh, maybe he has the ability. Taro. Or would. had the ability and in his old age lost it. Maybe like kind of my thought is Julianne had the ability and it says she gave it to her son. Maybe as age goes, magic goes, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You, and, 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 a magical yeah. impotence, if yeah. you will. You could have a great scene with Gerald and his son saying it's going to come to you soon. Yeah, yeah right. and we barely mentioned Taro because no, he's. I want to go back to a Taro. Yeah, because he's another underutilized character. Another underutilized character. He's very much willing to fight and wanting to take the fight to the kingdom. And her father, his father, is uh, constantly wants to play the politics. Yeah, which could also even, play to the fire idea because if he thinks yeah. he's his son's hot headed, but his daughter's not, and he goes, "Well, oh, he's definitely got that ability. He got mm. that from me, right?" Like he could definitely have that thought. It totally mm. sets it up, and then his death makes way more sense. It's and that's less the useless in the sense of story, right? Because mm. it, in the sense of story, the, his death makes no sense whatsoever, aside from that tragic moment where he gets dumped into the pit with his sister. And but, she wakes up to find him staring at her. Yeah. Dead. Which could have been much, much more poignant, but it wasn't. Um, mm-hmm. That's the problem with this movie yeah. a lot. That could have been much more poignant, but it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's like a constant here is we're constantly oh, like, t-shirt man, there. this would have been great. Yeah. That would be a lot more poignant, but it wasn't. Yeah. We just need a shirt that says, but it wasn't. But it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> 
It could have been good, but it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, just dot, 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 but it wasn't. Yeah. Because <laughs> I feel like even through talking this out, we've come up with like way better of like plot points on how to grow this. And if you put this without out changing like, the movie. without changing the movie mm-hmm. too much, just developing some of the characters, because we've, we've made some changes, right? Like we've obviously changed like the outfits, uh-huh. uh, or I don't know if you have, yeah, but like, I mentally have. Well, they were yeah, changing no, in my head as I was watching. I mean, if you can <laughs> yeah. make nods, like I think it's important to still capture that look of a frank frisetta painting yes Mm -hmm. but not don't overindulge it like if you're going to have tigra in her bikini make it a brief moment in the kingdom and then we're done with it like we did it comment of her being cold and then all of a sudden she's like yeah you know finding clothes or something yes these are people who do change their clothes i mean in the kingdom you would think she'd have a change of clothes yes especially if somebody who's clean and perfumed and pampered well not even the kingdom it'd be interesting after she gets captured because she's so used to being so to heat Mm. if she got cold in the jungle even though it's like a tropical jungle it's still gonna be colder than living next to a volcano Right, and yeah. so it would be very interesting if she did get cold, but maybe she's mean to heat, but she does feel cold. Oh, and and see them get dirty. Yes. <laughs> she's crawling around in logs and in swamps, and and not like that's something the animation doesn't convey. No, so that nobody's ever getting dirtied and bloodied, and that should happen. <laughs> it should happen. Yes. Yeah. This movie was actually being uh, was actually optioned by Robert Rodriguez yes, to get it was, remade. Yeah. And oh, I would love to see that. He's had it for a while, so I don't. I, I'm guessing that option's probably expired by uh, now. 2014. To well, he's had it before then, but yeah. it looks like Sony re-upped yeah. in 2014. Yeah. So I think we generally options are about eight years. So he, it, this could still happen. And as we know, Rodriguez sits on his options for quite a while. That's why Sin City two took forever which was a shame because and everybody really forgot the great. first one yeah. came out so yeah exactly yeah and i mean you never know the thing with rodriguez is when he's working on something you don't always know he's working on it until it comes out it's true yeah right. he's kind of secretive which is brilliant yeah and from what i've seen of what he's done especially if you think from dust till dawn i think he could really hit the aesthetic of this oh yeah yeah well he's been wanting so desperately to do some sort of fantasy film because he had red sonia there for a while so he's obviously just been chomping a bit to do some sort of fantasy movie. Yeah, and I, I think he's waiting for the time too, right? Because it, the thing is, his fantasy is cyclical, right? It, mm. it, 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 there's a, there's a, a period where it's really popular, and I think we kind of missed that window for good fantasy movies. Well, I think yeah. the good fantasy movies kind of when they were happening, you saw some really bad bombs, and then all the studios backed away from them because you had uh, John Carpenter. Mm -hmm. Uh, No, not sorry, John Carpenter. John Carter. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I said Carpenter, but you can see where the correlation is. John Carter, which was very visually stunning, but Disney, it bombed so hard, Disney pulled it from theaters, and you could not find it anywhere they didn't even yeah. do a dvd release like they actually waited a year to release the dvd it, it. it's a shame because it's a very good movie that was really botched in marketing uh not just marketing but like i also feel because a lot of people wouldn't understand what the books because the books came out in the what the 1920s? oh they were 100 years old by that point. yeah right yeah. so it's like yeah the because they're the book is from 1905 no yeah because it's about a civil war mm-hmm. commander right so it's like it's an old book going to mars and like everyone's like that's not what mars is like and it's like guys you know suspension of fantasy disbelief. it's it's and that was part of the problem it's a fantasy science fiction movie and from like the 1920s yeah and they had no idea how to market it i mean that was very apparent from the very but first then you also have film. like jason momoa in the conan reboot and then you had mm. uh dwayne johnson do the hercules movie those both bombed you know so i feel like at the same time and that was about 2014 clash of the titan clash remake. of the titan remakes which bombed but are there's still a pretty good mm-hmm. memes that go around from the first one but like you know what i mean they didn't do well and fantasy everyone was hoping with the hobbit that it would turn around and mm-hmm. it didn't and so i think it's, it's one of those they things, weren't making good ones yes because <laughs> they weren't making good ones <laughs> Uh, they took the Hobbit book and a book that's like 300, 400 pages. They made into three movies. And it's like, how'd you do? Oh, that is so, yeah, it was so overindulgent, but it's still two. I could have, I could have done two. Yeah. Yeah. But like was... that third one, it was like, what are we doing here? Why are we still here? Yeah. Like, you know, but it's still one of those things where it definitely is one of those things where maybe they are sitting on it and waiting for it to come back around, mm. but it is going to take one of those good properties to bring it around. It's and gonna, I don't think yeah. James Cameron's avatar is going to dandle it. No. Avatar two, three, four and five, which are yeah. all the books. And I, there's another one that's been sitting on the shelf so long. Mm. Does anybody give a f- 
flying fuck about those anymore. I don't know. I guess we'll wait and see when it finally surfaces again. But but again, it fits into that fantasy world, right? Even yeah. though it's sci-fi, yeah. it still somehow functions as fantasy with aliens. But like, it definitely be interesting to go back to that. But it's the problem is it it's it's you're right. It's you're hundred percent right. It's not the time for it. Mm-hmm. It's not what audiences are looking for. And the problem is by the time audiences are like they're like oh audience like this and they pull a project like this together it's still it's going to be either by the tail end of like uh, people enjoying it or it's going to miss the mark so it's got to be one of those ones if you're going to pull fantasy pulling something like this and then having roderick um rodriguez behind it i'm slurring my words apparently i'm not drunk i swear um yet I gave you vodka instead of water sorry that explains so much but yeah it's still one of those things where if you got a project like this off the ground, did it right, you could launch the next wave of fantasy know. films. Yeah, that's, mm-hmm. and, and that's what they should be doing with it because you're right. If they wait for it, by the time Rodriguez gets a film made, the cycle will probably be over. There would, there would have been it'll be all either these, right at the cusp yeah. or right at the tail end, and yeah. it'll just fall into like the, yeah. the no man's land. Yeah. Well, when I mean, when there's the genres are at a low that window to find that opening to get something out there and hit with the audience is it's such a small window. And I feel like the, the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings things that was hitting a very specific audience that really wanted it and wanted nothing else. And fantasies since moved over to television to more success with like game of Thrones. But even then, not much else has really struck it. I guess Vikings has done well. But Vikings, The Last Kingdom. Yeah, that, that one's good. a good show. Mm. Um, so but that's we're, a Netflix we're one. Yes. Yeah, so we're seeing these things starting to resurface again in, in a different way. And it just hasn't made it back to the big screen. And right now it's all superheroes. But even then you can mm-hmm. see superheroes is even starting to figure out that the audience has left a little bit. Mm-hmm. Which is why you're seeing like Wonder Woman was a period piece. And now Captain Marvel's a period piece. Mm-hmm. And like, which... It's Aquaman was like Lord of the Rings underwater mixed right. with Tron with all the <laughs> right, but it's like stuff. I feel like actually Aquaman hits closer to the fantasy than it, superhero. Absolutely, it does. And it's like I wonder if we're going to start seeing that trend because I honestly feel with like these these superhero movies are doing so well right now and ish. I'm not a big fan of where they're going with it. I feel like they've hit a certain point where they've like they've just flooded the market too much. Yeah, I think it's gonna we're going to start seeing. Less. I think we've peaked. I think we've peaked. Um, And I honestly think that was with uh, Avengers 3. I think the peak was around there. Mm -hmm. But it's like, it's one of those things where we still see so many of these, but it it feels like they're testing the waters to see what's going to be interesting. And I feel like they're doing it with Star Wars. I think we really saw this with Solo as well, because Solo is a Western. I'm not a fan of Westerns. I will put that out there right now. They're not my genre. But if you look at the plot and the style and the techniques behind Solo and, and the fact that they also didn't do a Christmas release with it, they did a summer release... They were testing the water for westerns. Obviously, the market's not there, but mm. I feel like they're trying to do these things where they're they're poking with. We have this. Let's make it like this and see how the market reacts to it. Which is why, like, well, that's how you give a, uh, these things longevity. You got to yeah. try to do different things. I think uh, the Captain America movies, specifically within the comic book genre, change from movie to movie yeah. and in its way and feel. And that's Marvel realizing that. They've do- already done this. Like the comic books have paved the way. We've told so many different types of stories. We can do this in the features as well. I, I feel like Marvel sometimes forgets that. They like their firsts are very formulaic. Yeah. Even Black Panther feels a lot like the Ugh. first Captain America. Yeah. It is it's the first very, Captain America. It's, it's very well done, but it's the same plot we've seen over and over again. And they're, they are guilty of regurgitating their own plot sometimes. And I think they can do better than that. And if they keep doing that, we're going to see the, that genre die. But I feel like if Aquaman does as well as they're hoping, I think it'll do because of Jason Momoa mostly because that man, wow, he's sexy. Um, but it's one of those things where I honestly think if that does well, we will see fantasy have a resurgence just the same way wonder woman did well. And all of a sudden we had a whole bunch of pretty much in the same year, we had a whole bunch of period pieces focused on not, not the war, but the side aspects of the war. Mm-hmm. Cause we had that one with 
uh, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie where they were in it together, and it was a and it pretty much came out the same year Wonder Woman did, but it was based on World War II, and it was about two spies from two different countries. But it's like again period pieces, and you'll see these peri- you saw a bunch mm. of period pieces because Wonder Woman did well. There were a lot of female spy movies that that right over the last few years too. So like just female driven action films, and I think Wonder Woman's really given that a resurgence and there's they're making creative ones as well which is why it's still working yes yeah and and people are are interested in seeing strong females on screen finally Mm -hmm. which is why i think if we're going to recast this and we're going to like really redo this i think we need to take tigra and make her the strong character she wasn't Mm -hmm. yes absolutely because that's what i actually was lacking most and i don't know if that's because of what i'm so used to in movies and then watching something from 1983 i'm like where is it? Yeah. But it's like, I mm-hmm. honestly feel like, especially because of the way they set her up, you know, you have to do your learning. Oh, I wish that I could be, you know, the men get all the glory. She has those lines. And I was like, I was like, all right, all right. I am ready. I am yeah. like sitting here. You've got the She's, setup. You've Let's got go. the setup. And then it just like, fell flat hard flat yeah. of she's now the damsel yeah and it's like but she had such like these like ambitions in dialogue that just didn't go and i feel like that is the point if you were going to remake this and the way to make this movie way stronger screw lauren don't make him the hero leave him as is make you know don't even have the final confrontation be between like keep the final confrontation as it is make lauren be essentially Jack from Big Trouble from Little China. He's just always there, but he's actually essentially useless. You know, make him the Indiana Jones and then make her character stand out more. Make him mm. be a tool for her to use. Yeah, I, that I would agree. be just so much better. Yeah, yeah. I, totally I, I, I've even in the original film, I feel like she's manipulating him, but that's just me projecting of what i actually want to be seeing on on the screen i feel like she's manipulating him to do what she wants and if if he becomes her foot soldier fine i'm fine with that i mean he can still be a heroic character but a heroic character who's kind of led by her intelligence yeah 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 Yeah, i'm i'm totally on board with that they said like i i think that he has things he's guilty that he's good at that she uses to her advantage Mm mm-hmm I think maybe he is a hunter. You know, we talked about that before, too. And, like, maybe that's why he wasn't on the wall and he showed back up from a hunting trip. Don't make him young. Make him a hunter. That He's good mm-hmm. at maneuvering through the jungles. Mm-hmm. He knows his footing. Yeah. He's not maybe great in a fight against something else that will fight back like a human, but he's good against animals. Mm-hmm. You know? Which is why all of his attacks work so well when he throws something at them, like the axe and the, the spear and all that stuff. Like, yeah, he's why great. Why he doesn't use the knife that's strapped to his leg. Yeah, right? he was fairly efficient the knife that's strapped to his leg wolves. is probably not even meant for killing. It's probably meant for cutting. Yeah. Skinning. Skinning. Yeah. It's, a, it's like yeah. it's a hunting knife. It's yeah. not a killing knife. Yeah. It all makes sense. It, 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 everything then makes sense to me yeah. right? if we do it that way. Cool. All right. Well, I think we're ready to recast this thing. What do you think? I think oh, so. I'm very interested to see what you guys picked. All right. Well, Sam, why don't you start us off? Okay. I will start us off because I like doing that. So I will start with the with Lauren because he's our useless character. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I cast KJ Appa from Archie. He plays Archie. Um, okay. Right? Because um, you were talking about the Frazetta look. I'm like, that guy is ripped. Like, he mm. is very much the Frazetta body type. I'll from, take your word for it because yeah. I haven't seen it. Yeah, yeah it, it's actually... He is jacked, man. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he's, he's a redhead in Archie, obviously, but it's dye, so, and you can put a blonde wig on him or whatever color wig you want, but I think he'd be great, especially if you're giving him sort of that action without mm-hmm. intelligence kind of role. See, that's kind of how I picked mine as well. Yeah, I can yeah, lie. I was yeah. like, who looks really good but kind of dumb? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah that was, that's pretty much it. Um, for my Tigra, I cast an actress by the name of Amber Midthunder. She's in the TV series Legion. She was also a supporting role in Hell or High Water. Um, mm. She's actually, I, I, she's quite good. And she's sort of an, an atypical beauty, which I kind of liked. Mm-hmm. And it feeds into my, my, my casting for all the people from the fire from the fire kingdom okay why is that because they're all native got it right. i did something simple yeah, similar yeah, i'm not gonna lie yeah. I, I like this yeah. um, <laughs> so i'm gonna save my dark wolf for last um Ooh, interesting for my necron i went with jared leto because creepy right um and i think he could play that kind of sexually ambiguous character that necron was written as in the in the original movie oh he was not sexually ambiguous ambiguous he was a uh, hundred percent into lauren yeah <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to go with ambiguous because uh, making a gay person the bad guy nowadays is really poor form. Uh, that's fair. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we'll just make him more interested in his power and not interested in anybody. 
I'm not gonna lie, that's one comment we didn't talk about, but I love the fact when he's like, I guess I'll mate with your sister. Like, it's like, it's a chore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that could still be very funny because it's, it's not, but it's not about his sexuality. It's about his fact that he has none. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm, okay. Making, making me sexual instead. That's right. Yeah. And I think, again, Leto could do that really well. For my Gerald, I cast Gil Birmingham. He's from House of Cards, Animal Kingdom, the Twilight movies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Slip that in there. Um, <laughs> again, another native actor, very large man, like imposing mm-hmm. man. I, and yeah, so I thought he'd be really good because Gerald looked imposing in the, even in the, in the animated film. Right. For my Taro, I'm with Alex Mraz, also in Twilight, but also in Suicide Squad and Bone Tomahawk. There's only one movie in there that even isn't slightly enticing. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, he 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 was. He, I mean, he, so he's got a he's got a history of picking bad roles, <laughs> or only having bad roles offered. Oh, well, no, not bad roles, bad movies. Bone Tomahawk is not a bad movie, but for the record, okay. the well, that was my exception. By yes, the way. yeah. Um, <laughs> for my Juliana, I went with Katie Segal. Mm-hmm. She wasn't my original cho- choice, but my original choice was maybe a little older. So for the Rolia, Rolla. Uh, the witch, yeah. The witch. Go ahead. Um, I will use my original casting because she'd make a great sister to Katie Seagal. I went with, or I'm going with Angelica Houston. Okay. I think that they're, they're, she's a little bit older, plays the older sister. Um, they, they actually could pass for sisters almost. Okay. Um, for my dark wolf, I went with Gerard Butler, get him into 300 shape, and he would make a great dark wolf. <laughs> and then for my director, I went with Christoph Gons, director of Brotherhood of the Wolf. Okay. I figure if you want to go sort of into the dark fantasy, I think that'd be a great way to go. Because he's... Yeah, no, that was, that's a very good movie. Yeah, it is a very good movie, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, him. Um, so, yeah, that's my casting Well, that, that I did anyhow. Okay, that sounds pretty good. Tony! All right, so uh, I kind of did a similar thing with uh, the people who were from the Kingdom of Fire, except for instead of going with Native, I went with people who were, like, African-American, because I thought maybe that would kind of play a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start with Tigra. Actually, I'll start with Lauren. Again, dumb and pretty. I went with Liam Hemsworth, because he's the worst Hemsworth. So I figured if we're going to do Lauren... You and I were on the exact same page. (laughs) That's why I didn't go with the Hemsworth. Well, that, that was my thought. I was like, Chris Hemsworth would be great. And then he also has the Australian accent, which is kind of always when they do fantasy, they pick, like... Australian and like English accents. Oh, so is KJ Apa. Oh, okay, there you go. I did not know that until mm-hmm. I was looking at his, at his biography. But it's still one of those things where it's like, I was like, I'm going to put him because he's pretty and he's pretty useless, especially in like the Hunger <laughs> Games and like Expendables. Uh, Expendables. <laughs> or even when he was in uh, the remake of, um, oh, fuck, uh, Red. Oh, Red Dawn. Red Dawn, thank you. I was like, the second words this gave me. Red Dawn. <laughs> we haven't covered that yet. No, we haven't. Yeah, he was, he's pretty useless in that. And so I was like, okay, useless. Perfect. He's perfect for Lion. We know he can do this. <laughs> and then for Tigra, I went with uh, Candace Patton from The Flash. Okay. So, like, she hasn't done a whole lot of other stuff, but I feel like I think she could pull off that intelligence, that cunning kind of what i wanted more out of the character that's kind of what she does in the flash anyhow right right so, mm-hmm. yeah I, i'm with you on that. that that's kind of where i was going and then so for the king or Jeral, i went with idris elba <laughs> a, a favorite a favorite because mm-hmm. i was just like he fits um i did think of uh david david rain but i think he just works a little bit better mm-hmm. um and then for taro uh the brother uh that is the brother right yeah yeah mm-hmm. uh uh, Daniel, I'm going to butcher his last name, Kaluga or Kaluya, Kaluya. from yep. from Get Out. I think him as the brother, the hot headed brother. You know, we've seen what he does in Black Panther. We know he can play that role. I think he'd be perfect for it. He'd be good. And yeah. so it's like I just kind of went like that's kind of where I would make that kingdom and make them the heroes. And I guess I mm. kind of like I was watching this and I was like, this feels like it'd be a great plot for Black Panther. You know, like, <laughs> except for not with Black Panther. And so it's like that's kind of where my brain went to. And I was like, I'm going to cast it this way. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so then I went with uh, for Juliana Charlize Theron. Okay. Because I figure. She does really good in, like, um, the Huntsman movies, which really did terrible. The first one because it had Kristen Stewart. The second she's, one... Be- she's good in them, though. She's great in it. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. But that's... It was the... It was because of her in there that that movie did not do well. Oh, well, exactly. Uh, because, who's the fairest of them all? Well, the evil queen, obviously. Yeah. Right? Like, she's... <laughs> Based on that casting, it's the yeah. evil queen. <laughs> yeah. She's not pretty. She looks dumb. But, you know, she actually did decent in the movies, but I... They didn't get, like, what they needed, but they got enough of a budget to do the second one, which was actually way better. I don't know if you watched the second one. I have not seen the second one as of yet. I've seen the first one, though. It's actually really fun to watch, and it doesn't 
feel like the first one because it's technically a prequel Mm -hmm. um and it focuses more on the huntsman which is really cool but anyway uh that aside so i thought the way that she played the evil queen in that i feel like she would nail it in this and then um because she's blonde and then i was like well necron kind of had the white hair but it could be worked work better blonde whereas like juliana was dark haired for some reason i was like that makes no sense Mm -hmm. i actually thought Simon Pegg would be actually really interesting in a role like that mm. as a villain because I I know he can do very very serious stuff. He's he's a very funny actor, but he does very serious sometimes. And when he does serious, he does it well, and I've yeah. always wanted to see him pull a villain role. Did you ever see that Doctor Who episode he was in? where he was kind of the henchman to this creature, but the creature had to be cold, so he was actually all frosted over yes. to the whole time of that, that episode. It was that really... is also where my brain went to with yeah. this. Even though he was a henchman in that, I think I think him playing, I guess, ambiguous, sexually ambiguous, kind of off the cuff, would be very interesting. Mm-hmm. I'm, yeah, I'm on board with that, yeah. Um, and I didn't cast the witch because when I wanted to rewrite the movie, I was like, that scene was useless. <laughs> and, and, fair. and so I didn't actually writing this cast that and then talking about it. I'm like, I almost I wish didn't I either. And then just things started popping in my brain when and I was doing so it. So that was like, I just couldn't come up with anything for that. But I, mm. I don't know who I would cast knowing with my Charlize there. And I'd have to really ponder who I'd want to play a sister. A sister. Role. Yeah. No yeah. kidding. That makes it a lot tougher. <laughs> right. And I'm like, okay, I got to find someone who's roughly around the same age who has a similar look. And I yeah. can't. Nicole Kidman, done. <laughs> there you go. Damn. That's a set I want to be on. <laughs> right? Anyway, they're about the same. They look roughly similar. They can play a lot of similar roles, and I feel like sisters wouldn't be a far fetch for them. Yeah. And they're both Australian. Do you have a fantasy Australian. director? I hadn't actually thought about a director, but Rodriguez would be with that I, kind of cast. I would want Rodriguez. And the one I didn't mm. say as well, but this is just because I think he'd be hilarious in it for Dark Wolf The Rock. Wayne Johnson. <laughs> it, it, it did pass my mind. Uh, that it, it, I know it's it the was, obvious it, it's one. So, yeah. it's, and that's the thing is there, it's so easy to go to these same sort of big buff actors like Momoa and The Rock and Bautista are sort of all sort of the, the big, big guys right now. Right. And that's but, why I went with, with Butler because I wanted somebody a little more mature mm-hmm. and not as recognizable as the big muscular guy. I still think Butler, though, he's a little bit too mature for the role, even though he'd be wearing a cowl the entire time. Whereas I think The Rock doing it, you'd still be able to tell it's The Rock, so you'd still be able to get the fame fa- like factor mm. to it, which would be a draw. And then having him be the like the mentor character would be interesting because he hasn't played mentor often. He's played action hero, but to put him in a mentor role would be interesting. Yeah. I know, you know the reason, one of the reasons I didn't go with him is because he's already done the role where he wears an animal on his head. Hercules. Well, I got the feeling like in this movie, like he's a supporting role. He doesn't say a lot. It's a lot of growling. So I needed somebody big and intimidating who could deliver those mean lines, but is better with a supporting cast. Kind of like Aquaman. <laughs> so yes, my Dark Wolf wound up being Jason Momoa. But what drove my casting for for my version is I really wanted it to feel like the Frazetta paintings coming to life. So I was casting with that kind of in mind and how those characters looked on that screen. Can I ask you a question? Yes. That was actually part of why I cast the rock. He has those mad tattoos that are very mm. Aztec styled and I would want to leave those I, in. I think that would fit very well with as would Momoa's becoming that, that kingdom. Right? And that's kind of why yeah. I was like, that's why I picked him as well as he has mm-hmm. that ink. And I'm like, that ink is solid for the role. Mm-hmm. And that's also why I was thinking Momoa. Cause you there only have a lot to cover my... up the, the, the bowl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like, you know, the one he has on the forearm and yep. like those kind of stuff, you could keep that in. Yeah. And they, yeah, exactly. That's just kind of comes with the, the actor and you don't no makeup needed. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, and that's the, the thing is, is they're starting to sort of embrace those tattoos of, for, especially for Momoa. Like he, he mm-hmm. I mean, instead of trying to cover them up, they just enhance them. They add more. Yeah. Right? And I think that's awesome. Sorry. I, I didn't want to jump nope, on yours, no, but it's like, that was part of my thought process. Yeah. I love those tattoos. And again, he'd be still wearing a cowl. You wouldn't be able to see his face, but you know who it is which because, keep, of, yeah. because of the tattoos. So you could easily keep the fame factor. Whereas if you covered his face, It'd be like whenever you have Tom Hardy in a role where you don't see his face. Mm-hmm. It's like, that was Tom Hardy? And yeah, you lose you never, the fame factor. You never know. I don't even know how Tom Hardy normally sounds because he's changing his voice and mannerisms almost every role. So, yeah, he's he's just one of those guys. If you covered him up, you'd never know who, who it was. Yeah, and I think when it comes to if you took a picture like this and if you wanted to market it, and that's, I guess, how producers think. is like you want to make mm-hmm. sure in that lead role you want to have someone. And having... 
Dwayne the Rock Johnson versus Simon Pegg at the end would be hilarious. Then <laughs> 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 my brain pa- filled that in. I was yeah. like, yes, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty awesome. All right, let's get into mine here. Sorry. No, not a not a worry. My uh, director, I'm going to go with Neil Marshall. He does well with this sort of thing, and he's directed some of the biggest episodes of Game of Thrones, so he knows what he's doing with fantasy. Uh, as we already know, my Larn is Liam Hemsworth uh, for very much the same reasons. <laughs> <laughs> the other Hemsworth. Um, I had my Tigra, and then I when I you get down the, that IMD rabbit hole and I accidentally landed somewhere and I'm like, fuck, she looks like Tigra. So I had started with Emma Dumont from The Gifted and then quickly crossed that out when Emily Browning surfaced. And I'm like, holy shit, she looks like a Frazetta drawing. Yeah. <laughs> and that really did inform a lot of what I was going for. For my Necron, I went with Danila Kozlovsky. He was in Hardcore Henry as Aiken, and he's also on Vikings. And if you remember in Hardcore Aiken, he's got oh, that yeah, I really he's, white yeah. hair. And oh, okay, he's, okay. It, in, in a way, he's already Necron in that movie because yeah. he's a strong telekinetic. Mm-hmm. Um, so he had the look already based on how that character looked in Hardcore Henry. So I'm like, damn, yeah, I want that dude. For his mother, uh, Juliana, I went with Julianne Moore. Oh, interesting. Which, again, I think fits the bill. She looks kind of the way the character looks to me. Uh, Dark Wolf, as I said, is Jason Momoa. King Gerald, I went with Graham McTavish. He was in Aquaman mm-hmm. as the, the underwater king that in that kingdom he goes to where he, you know he's sitting in the chair and dead. Um, he's the uh, Saint of Killers on Preacher. Okay. And he was also in the Hobbit movies as well. I went with uh, Theo James as his son Taro. He's uh, one of the stars of the Divergent franchise. Try mm-hmm. not to hold it against him, but he's kind of got the look I was going for. For Rolio the Witch, which even now that we've made her the sister of Juliana, this even works even better for me. Jane Seymour. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. I can I, see them being sisters. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know, there's the, the enchanting quality that you might have in a witch uh, from Jane Seymour where, you know, that, that fantasy aspect of her. I'm like, I think I think that would be good. And she's aged well. And for uh, Otwa, because I just wanted to have fun casting some big dude as uh, Rolio's mm. son slash whatever he was, uh, big seven foot guy from hobbit and game of thrones and man thing which nobody's ever seen uh conan stevens he right. plays a lot of big dudes okay <laughs> so he's just your big guy he's my big guy just because i wanted one there you go <laughs> like why not why not he's gonna stand taller than everybody else let's let's find somebody that fits the part so that's my cast they all work really well i think so i think everybody's cast is is very good and valid and we can play mix and match and it'll all be fantastic i agree i like that you mean went with like the yeah. fire king, well, king I, well, like... I was think, thinking that first off one is is you make the fire king a cultural center so you want everybody to sort of have mm-hmm. sort of the same ethnic background mm-hmm. and especially if they're family especially if they're family sure. yeah so uh, so that that made it fairly easy to decide which way to go and then i found one actor i'm like oh that informed a whole bunch of stuff right yeah yeah like one of the reasons i chose jason momoa for dark wolf is he had kind of uh, a more tanned look yeah. in, in the film. So he wasn't so pale, which is kind of weird that everybody in the Fire Kingdom was so pale. Yes. So I kind of like your choices for, for that as a cultural center, for sure. Going either Native or African American, I think, is is a great way to go, for sure. And I almost want to go do more Native, because I don't think enough Native actors and get that enough That was parts. the other thing that formed my choice, is... Mm-hmm. is, is it, it, I like it, that, actually. It, yeah. Mm-hmm. That was yeah. That was part of my 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 thinking process. And when we were talking, when we had ideas, that was and mine's going to take a little more research. That was my idea. Right? It was that, so I'm going to start there, and that's going to be my 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 starting point. Right. <laughs> right. And the, I think that I did the same thing too. Is like my first cast was Tigra. Before I cast like anyone else, I was like, I got to cast her, and I got to figure her out because it's like when I was like in my brain, I'm like, if I'm going to remake this movie, I'm going to make it about her. I'm not going to make it like about Lauren. And yeah, there's dark wolf there but it's like i want it to be more about her and her story because i feel like that's where most of the story focuses yeah and i think part of what makes dark wolf enticing is not knowing anything about him so tiger seems to be the most interesting character to build upon because the building block was there they just chose to ignore it yes yeah 
And which I'm disappointed by yeah. so hard. Because, again, I remember, again, watching this younger. I think maybe it's I had ADD or something. Because I'm like, oh, but yeah, that movie was epic to watch. And then watching it, I go, where's the story? Yeah. There, was there a story? Mm-hmm. I think there's a story. And it's like, there is a story, but it's so undercurrent that it's like, between the action scenes, there's not really. It's like, they just focus so hard on the action. It's a basic story. It's like Fire, fire versus Ice is basically what it is. And mm-hmm. it's sort of push forward by the kidnapping and and Tira is the central character of the of the of the original movie whether you recognize it or not because mm-hmm. she's the one that everybody wants. Oh, one of the alternative posters I actually when I was doing some research online I saw a foreign poster and the movie's actually called Tigra. I guess they just renamed her a little bit, but it is named after her, which yeah. makes sense. You know, yeah. she's the main focus, she's the center of all this, you know, Necron's kidnapped her. Yeah. Which is interesting that they would power. do that because if I was to watch that and go and like as it is and if I knew it was named after her I'd watch that and go why was that named after yeah. her? Yeah. Uh, I mean the way the movie watches yeah I'd question that as well. Yeah. But it'd but, be interesting if you were to redo this to call it Tigra yeah. the Battle of Fire and Ice like that's how I would name this like I wouldn't just call it Fire and Ice because if you were to take the, like that in a modern movie setting to the theaters it wouldn't entice people to go see it unless I feel like Fire and Ice has actually become kind of generic right uh, and and a generic fantasy title no less because it's been used on so many different fantasy movies that are unrelated now which is why if I was to rename it I'd make it the subheading I wouldn't make it the main heading I'd want to focus on her well, yeah. the way we've plotted that out, it would definitely work out better with that <laughs> title would, for it sure. It would definitely work out a lot better, yeah, just because we, we have made her, um, re-emphasized the focus on her as the main character and made her a strong, I'm hoping a stronger, more competent character. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and ultimately, they, they, one of, the, one of the, the heroes of the story rather than just sort of the damsel in distress, because she really is just the damsel in distress in the end. Mm-hmm. And they did her a disservice. Yeah, they did. absolutely did. And that that was my strongest feeling walking away from that. I was very much raging about that. <laughs> my, my, when my wife, she's like, what's wrong now? I'm like, this movie, damn it. <laughs> I remembered it so differently. <laughs> yeah. It was so much better in my head. I should have left it yeah. there. Tainted youth. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Don't sing anymore. I don't want a, a lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. No, I'm not singing anymore anyhow. It's- <laughs> it popped into my head. I had to do it. Um. Destroyed childhoods. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us, Tony. Yeah, this has been I fun. much appreciated it. Do us a favor. Go support Tony over on Flix X Raids. Uh, tell everybody where to find the show and uh, when you drop. Um, well, I drop every Tuesday. Um, I'm not sure when you guys are going to air this. I'm not going to every reveal. Tuesdays. <laughs> hey, look at that. Well, I was like, I don't know which episode is going to come out when this one comes out, so I'm just not going to touch that. But I drop on Tuesdays. Uh, what we do is we have a roundtable discussion about a movie. So what we do is we watch the movie beforehand. We'll sit down. We'll discuss it. We play some games, mostly trivia games, kind of uh, guessing movie titles, discuss different aspects of it. Uh, give a movie a rating and review, and then we kind of uh, what we learned watching the movie, which usually is nothing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we have a lot of fun doing it. We drop on Tuesdays. You can find us on every major podcasting platform: iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher. You know, all of those podcast addict type services uh you can also find us on twitter on facebook on instagram give us a follow find out more of when we drop and we obviously have our website flixxraid.com excellent and while you're checking out flix x raid over on twitter and facebook and instagram um if you haven't already liked our pages there as well please do that we are invasion of the remake on Facebook and Instagram, and at Invasion Remake on Twitter. And uh, make sure you pass that along to all your friends as well, like our pages, and subscribe to the show on all those wonderful podcast providers that Tony just mentioned. And if you're not sure where to find us, we've got a link tree up on all of our social media as well, so you can just click and find the one that works best for you. A link tree. I've never heard it called that way, and I really like that. (laughs) It's actually called link tree. I did not know that. All right, I'm learning things. What I learned. <laughs> you actually did learn something this week. Um, 
Hot damn. <laughs> how, how dare we? Yeah, how dare we leave you with more something? More often than not, I, I go, I learned, don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> That's more often than not what I learned, is what not to do. Oh, that is often the theme of this show. Yes. We're <laughs> finding that the errors are made, erasing them, and trying to make them better, because why remake a movie that was already good the first time? Let's find something that had that nugget of a good idea and expand upon it, and those of the movies are worth remaking. Yes. Don't just keep rehashing the ones that were really good and be like, we're going to make this again, but better. Doesn't yeah, because people want to see the movie that they've already seen done well. They'll watch the one that was done well. Yes. Exactly. Are you going to watch RoboCop 2011 or are you going to watch the 1980s RoboCop? 1980s. Yes. Okay, I'm going to watch the 2011 and then bitch about it, then go watch the 1980s one. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's how I'm going to do that. That one's not even that terrible. It's not even that terrible. If, if, if I didn't have the frame of reference of the original, I probably would have enjoyed it a lot more. Mm-hmm. It's like um, Total Recall. I, f- I feel like if I hadn't watched the original Arnie Total Recall and watched the new Total Recall, I'd be like, yeah, all right, this is a cool movie. But then with the frame mm-hmm. of reference and watching the new one, I'm like, where's Mars? Yeah. <laughs> where's Mars? Where's uh, half the plot? <laughs> Still an entertaining movie. We agree with you on that one. But it's like, call it something else. Mm-hmm. Or frame it up as like not even a sequel or a remake, but like this is another story of Total Recall. Because that was the name of the company, right? So it's like that's you, right. You could easily frame it that way, but they didn't do that. They they framed it as a remake, and it's like, why'd you do that? Yeah, I I missed the TV series, so I'm not sure how they did it on that show. I missed it too. Didn't yeah. even know it existed, to be honest. No, I knew it existed, and I purposely chose not to watch it. <laughs> yeah, me too. I love science fiction. Still missed it. <laughs> yeah, still still had like, that decision. It's to Canadian. Be like, it can't no. be good. It can't be good. You know, yeah, we have some nice. friends that watch TV shows for the first time. We should touch up to them and see about doing an episode with them about that one. Ooh, Ooh there you go. Mm. There you go. <laughs> hmm. Well, that's a that's a thought. Yeah. All right, we'll discuss it later. Yes. Well, I I think we're done here. That was fire and ice. I hope you enjoyed our version of it. I've been Jason. I am always Sam. I'm Tony. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and we are. Out of here. Thanks for joining us, Tony. You've caught me, but you'll never hand me over to Necron. You'll have to kill me first. Don't hunt for death, boy. It finds us all soon enough.